We will start part B by answering a key question. What is the maximum power that can be extracted from the wind? It's useful to recognize an analogy between aircraft propellers and wind turbine rotors, both of which have air moving through them. Many people are familiar with propeller-driven aircraft. The engine provides power to the propeller, which moves air, increasing the kinetic energy of air moving through the propeller. There is an increase in the momentum of the air associated with air, this air velocity increase, and that change in momentum results in a thrust force on the plane. In the case of a wind turbine, moving air gives up some kinetic energy to the wind turbine rotor, which generates power. As we will see, there is also a thrust force associated with this decrease in momentum, and this force must be resisted by the wind turbine supporting structure. Let's review a few basics needed for analysis. For a wind turbine having blades of length r, the area swept out by the blades is pi r squared. The mass flow rate m dot through a stream tube having area a, the shaded section, is rho av, where rho is the density of the air. We can also identify a number of axial locations that will be useful in the subsequent analysis. So first of all, plane zero, which is upstream of the wind turbine, that would be the wind undisturbed by the wind turbine. Uh, plane one, which is the plane swept by the wind turbine blades. And plane two, downstream of the wind turbine. We'll talk about the different cross-sectional areas at the three planes in a moment. Now let's consider the air at the stream tube inlet, plane zero, where the blue arrow is. Just thinking about the air now, not the wind turbine, uh, we can say that the kinetic energy of moving air for wind speed v is given by one-half v squared. Using this, we can now compute the power as being equal to the mass rate at which air moves to the wind turbine, times its kinetic energy per unit mass. Substituting mass flow rate, rho AV, and kinetic energy per unit mass, one half V squared, gives us one half rho AV cubed as the power available in the moving air. Now consider the airflow across the wind turbine, plane one and the figure on slide four. The wind turbine extracts some kinetic energy from the flow, reducing the wind speed from V0 upstream of the wind turbine to V1 at the wind turbine plane and then V2 downstream. The power that can be extracted by the wind turbine is equal to the mass flow rate of air times this reduction in the air's kinetic energy. Substituting, we have the power of the turbine is equal to the mass flow rate here, rho a v1, at where the mass flow rate is at the plane of the wind turbine, uh, times the change in the kinetic energy from upstream to downstream of the wind turbine. The equation at the bottom has a slightly cl cleaner form, uh, which is easier to use subsequently. The flow is decelerating, the airflow is decelerating through the wind turbine as there is a reduced velocity downstream. A decelerating flow undergoes a pressure rise, which we can calculate using Bernoulli's equation for flow along a streamline. In Bernoulli's equation, on a per unit mass basis, the first term is the potential energy, the second term is the pressure force, and the third term is the kinetic energy. For a wind turbine, changes in potential energy can be neglected, so we can eliminate the GH terms from both sides of the equation. Solving for the pressure rise gives an expression uh, related to the change in kinetic energy from upstream to downstream, so V0 squared minus V2 squared. Just as an aside here, a, a comment, note that the pressure rise uh, in this circumstance is very small compared to atmospheric pressure. Uh, just as an aside, now we're in a position to explain why the cross-sectional area at 2 is larger than at 1, the plane 1, the plane 0. Can consider the mass flow rate equation. Rho is equal to, m dot air is equal to rho AV. 
Density doesn't change very much through the wind turbine. If the velocity decreases from plane 0 to plane 2, then the cross-sectional area A must increase from plane 0 to plane 2 to deliver the same mass flow rate through the stream tube. So, so now you can see why uh, the I image shows uh, increasing cross-sectional area as we move through the wind turbine. The pressure difference between plane 0 and 2 creates an axial thrust force, a pressure difference times an area. In this case, the expression from the previous slide has been substituted for the actual pressure difference P2 minus P0. The axial thrust force is also equal to the change of momentum, m dot air times uh, delta V, V0 minus V2. So we can replace m dot air by rho A V1, where uh, m dot air is evaluated at the plane of the wind turbine. Equating the two expressions for thrust force and solving for V1, we find that V1 is essentially equal to the average of V0 and V2. And this is helpful because now we can eliminate V1 from our ex expression for wind turbine power output. So the bottom line of this slide shows us that the power output of the wind turbine is equal to 1 half rho A. The term in square brackets, the first term in square brackets is essentially V1, now replaced by this uh, expression. And then the second term is the change in kinetic energy which occurs between the upstream and downstream conditions. It's useful to express the equation at the bottom of the last slide for power in terms of V2 over V0, which puts the upstream wind speed then in front of the square bracket term. So here's our V0 upstream uh, wind speed uh, cubed in this case. The wind turbine power output here will be maximized when the term in square brackets here is uh, maximized. And to find that maximum, we can simply differentiate the term in square brackets with respect to the normalized uh, downstream velocity V2 over V0 and set that equal to 0. From the differentiation, the term in square brackets is maximized when V2 is equal to V0 over 3. At that condition, when V2 is equal to V0 over 3, the term in square brackets has a numerical value of 16 over 27, which in decimal form is 0 0.593. This is known as the Betz limit on wind turbine performance, and essentially the maximum power output that can be extracted by a wind turbine is equal to the power that's available in the air, 1 half rho A V0 cubed, uh, reduced by this factor 1627, 1627s, which is the from the bets, which is the bets limit effectively. So the bets limit tells us that the best we can do with a wind turbine is to produce 1627s, or just under 60 percent of the power available in the air. Some final comments about the maximum power condition where the wind turbine has extracted sufficient energy from the air to reduce the downstream wind speed to one-third of the upstream wind speed. Upstream, the wind's kinetic energy per unit mass is one-half V0 squared. Downstream, it is one-half V0 over 3 squared. Thus, the downstream wind has only one-ninth the kinetic energy per unit mass of the upstream wind. This means that the wind turbine is extracted 8 ninths of the initial kinetic energy. Let's now summarize this lecture on, maximum, on the maximum power that can be extracted from the wind. We saw that power can be calculated as the mass flow rate at which air moves through a wind turbine times the kinetic energy per unit mass. So the simple expression then, power is equal to 1 half rho AV cubed, represents the energy available in the wind. We also saw that there is a limit, the Betz limit, which gives the maximum power that can be extracted from the wind, and it's simply the power available in the air, 1 half rho AV zero cubed, times the numerical fraction 16 over 27. 
So no wind turbine can do better than that. That represents an upper bound on the performance. In the next few lectures, we will look at how much power can be extracted from the wind by real wind turbines. Please try the questions that follow to give you some practice with the concepts related to calculating the maximum power available from the wind.